Msagir Ibrahim, thanks for joining us. We start with security now, where the Minister of State for Defence, Bello Matawale, along with other service chiefs, visited Plateau State shortly after a fresh attack by gunmen, which claimed the lives of a father and his son in Durbi Village, Jos East, local government area of the state. The delegation, including the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Alleviation, Dr. Beta Edu, arrived at the Akubugowan airport as the state grapples with insecurity and a humanitarian crisis. Trust TV's Musa has the details. Chiefs in attendance were Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Taurid Lagbaja, Chief of Naval Staff, Vice Admiral Emmanuel Ogala, and Chief of Air Staff, Air Marshal Hassan Abubakar. Their visit is aimed at assessing the security situation and expressing sympathy for the recent attacks. During their visit to one of the affected communities, the service chiefs vowed to put an end to the needless killing in the state. <laughs> to protect life and property of all citizens and to bear with perpetrators of this act. Why we are here is to know the facts of, of what was transpired. I sure you, all those involved of this must be brought the travels of this insecurity are within the community. They are the life of the people. So we want to address these drivers of insecurity. We want to bring peace. We want to ensure lasting stability on the plateau. So what I appeal is that you walk with the troops. They need you to provide information. You have said it, that when you raise an alarm, the troops responded. If it had been the other way around, I would have investigated it and take appropriate action. So continue to provide information for these troops and they will continue to respond. If they do not respond, then relay such information back to us. Minister for Humanitarian Affairs, Betty Edu, while offering condolences to the communities, mentioned that President Tinubu has directed her ministry to provide all necessary relief materials to assist the victims and alleviate their suffering resulting from the incident. We would, in our intervention, be providing food items for persons who have been displaced, cooking items, we would be providing mattresses, blankets, some clothing that can be of help to you and other personal effects and materials that should be used by you at this point when you're displaced from home. As part of the durable solutions, we'll be working with the Refugee Commission and of course the program in the ministry which is called Shelter for Poor, Internally Displaced and Refugees, to see that we can give assistance to some of the homes in terms of renovating them and bringing them back to shape so you can move back home. Members of the community expressed their concerns about the attacks while appealing for increased military presence to help tackle the menace. This is the second year here. And so we have time to go around to find it. No single person will be behind. I don't know whether you are now or two That is the saddest one. It's all like that, all the seven or eight villages that this people have been doing. He has gone around and said, This is the situation of our masters. We are living peacefully with our neighbors. All these areas that have been affected, we are never our people. At any point, with any person, that you will make sure the communities that are going to be affected. Please, from 2001 or even before that time, people 
people have been chased out of their ancestral land and have been occupied by this whole act of another power. Please have the new heavens. We are seriously and curiously, we want to go back to our ancestral past. The recent killings in Plateau State has captured the attention and imagination of the country as the spotlight shines on Nigeria's endemic battle against insecurity. Adam Musa, Trust TV News, George. Similarly, three persons were killed in Derby village of Sherid district in Jos East local government area of Plateau State. Confirming the incident, the Transition Committee Chairman for just East local government area, Marcus Yam said the attackers invaded the village on Saturday night, killing a father and his son. The chairman said the efforts of the vigilantes in the community who engaged the assailants resulted in the death of one of the attackers while others fled the scene. The chairman added that personnel of the Joint Security Task Force of Operation Safe Haven also responded to the distress call from the community. When contacted, the spokesperson of Operation Safe Haven Captain Oya James said the incident was a kidnapping attempt and not an attack by bandits. He also added that it was an abduction attempt on one Luca Kaze whose son was killed in the process. Now joining us via telephone is Trust TV's Ado Musa to give an insight into the latest incident and the service chief's visit. Welcome to the news hour, Ado. Uh, many have described this incident as an attack, but the authorities are saying otherwise. So what are the feelers we are getting on the ground currently? Well, uh, according to local authorities and uh, security agencies, uh, the attack wasn't a uh, uh, a normal attack that uh, is often launched on the entire community. Uh, it was just uh, uh, a kidnapping attempt, uh, which was meant to uh, abduct a father and his son. Uh, like uh, the commissioner of, uh, commissioner of police uh, came out to also clear the air that uh, it wasn't an attack uh, on the entire community. It was purely uh, a kidnapping attempt, which uh, the police and the youth in the community were able to uh, repel. So both the police and Operation Safe Heaven uh, confirmed to uh, us that it wasn't uh, an attack as uh, reported by other media outlets, but it was just uh, a kidnapping attempt which uh, was eventually repelled. Okay, Adu, uh, was the, the response and, and the clarity made by the security agencies enough to douse the tensions? Because as we know, unfortunately, this incident started um, since Saturday through Christmas, and we've been seeing a recurrence of some of these issues. So was it enough to douse some of the tensions? Because as we know, some of these residents are still coping with the trauma of earlier attacks, which led to, of course, countless lives, close to 200 now. Yes, you know, this uh, uh, latest incident happened in Justice, uh, which is different from uh, Bokos or Barikin Lady. And so uh, when I spoke to uh, some of the residents of Justice uh, this morning, they told me that uh, uh, normality has been restored uh, because even some of them attended to church services and uh, normal activities uh, were ongoing. So I want to believe that uh, uh, for the police to, uh, or other security agencies to come out and clear the air, uh, is also uh, enough to doubt the tension that uh, it wasn't uh, a kind of a general attack that people used to experience. Okay, Ado, thank you very much for the clarification. Now, there's the attacks in Bokos and all of the other villages around Berkin Ladi and other villages as well. And then there's this incident in Jos East. So, are there existing concerns over the chance of bandits and kidnappers being on rampage at the same time in the state? Well, uh, the, just like uh, uh, the chairman of the Justice said it this morning, that uh, uh, it was uh, just uh, a kind of attack by government. But if you look at it, what happened in Bokos and Barikin uh, a lot of local authorities were saying that, uh, yes, it is a banditry attack. Uh, and then uh, when you compare it with what happened in Justice, you, 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 you find it difficult to even relate it because... Uh, since the police said that this is uh, just uh, a kidnapping attempt, while well, what happened in Bokos and uh, Bariki we, 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 we are not uh, kidnapping attempt. It was just uh, a purely 
uh, an act of criminality. So I think uh, w what we are saying now is we may not relate to what happened in justice and uh, Bopos and Barikin Lady to say that, yes, uh, probably uh, people will begin to see a kind of uh, banditry activities everywhere in the state. All right, thank you very much, Adumusa, for the update. We'll touch base with you subsequently as events develop. Thank you very much. Yes, that was Adumusa, Trust TV reporter in Plateau State, giving us updates there on the situation in Just East. Moving on, however, to forestall any incident during the New Year celebrations in Plateau State, the Bonguam Joss and chairman of the Joss Joint Traditional Council, Dad Jacob Gang Buba, have cancelled the annual New Year Cultural Festival observed at the beginning of every year in the state. Also, the Emir of Wase and President of the Wase Traditional Council, Mohammed Sambo Haruna, has announced the postponement of the annual Fulani Cultural Festival, Nyalde Fulaku, scheduled for January 6, 2024. Gang Buba, in a statement signed by his special assistant, Dai Yakubu Mamandang, said that the directive followed the recent killings in Bokos, Mangu, and Burkinladi local government areas. On his part, Mohammed, in a statement signed by the secretary of the Wase Emirate Council, Ibrahim Jalo, said that the postponement of the Fulani event, which was also meant to raise 5 million naira for the furnishing and equipping of the Emirates Information and Communication Center was in reverence to the killing of more than 195 people in Burkin Ladi, Bokos and Mongu local government areas. Sitting security operatives of the Kogi State Police Command in collaboration with the military and local vigilantes have rescued 24 victims of kidnappers within Adogo Axis in Ajakuta local government area in the state. The State Police Command Poli Public Relations Officer S.P. William Ayer disclosed this on Saturday saying that the victims were kidnapped on Friday. The police authorities said 21 victims, including 11 students and three teachers, were rescued on hurt, stressing that effort is ongoing to arrest the fleeing members of the gang. The State Police Commissioner, C.P. Bertrand Onoha, commended the efforts of the team assuring of continuous onslaught against criminal elements in the state. The CPO now had therefore enjoined the law-abiding citizens of the state to continue to collaborate with the police and other security agencies by volunteering a timely and credible information on the activities of criminal elements in the state. No, now today you see the person. All of them. Is. The guy don't have to Look at them. Look at them. Silvari! Silvari! The armor will be at the front! The armor will be at the back! 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 Also, Borno State Governor Babagana Umara Zulum is calling for swift justice in the case of the National Union of Road Transport Workers Driver, reportedly killed by a soldier along Gamburu International Road in Borno State. The governor's stance was conveyed by the secretary to the state government, Bukar Tijani, during a press briefing at the government house in Meduguri. He highlighted that the state government has initiated dialogue with the military leadership, launching a thorough investigation into the incident. Secondly, I want on behalf of His Excellency for the union, other members of the public, or not state citizens, and even broadly Nigerians, to be patient. To look at this incident as an incident which has happened, but at the same time is a condemnable incident. It is also an incident that must be avoided. <coughs> to say the least, his Excellency 
some few months back, rush to Gomborungala to Dikwa, to Mafa, to ensure that the Bono State government, with the support of the military, opened the Maidugri, Mafa, Dikwa, Gomborungala road so that citizens can have their normal business of traveling, trading, visiting kin and kid, and other things that lawfully Nigerian citizens can do. And so therefore, anything that would prevent the free movement of our people <coughs> who are lawfully doing their everyday business must be avoided. And the Bono State government would make sure that this road would be open for normal traveling, normal business. According to the United Nations Industrial Organization, Nigeria generates over 32 million tons of waste annually, with plastic accounting for 2.5 million tons. The alarming issue of poor waste management is a significant concern for residents of Abuja, Nigeria's capital in Karu. Abuja residents are calling on the FCT administration to urgently order the evacuation of a substantial waste deposit near the Karu Muslim Cemetery to restore sanitation to the area. Trust TV's Ibrahim Ismail reports. This substantial waste bin is situated just off a major expressway in the Karu area of the federal capital, Abuja, dangerously close to the Karu Muslim Cemetery. The waste consisting of plastic, leather, and leftovers emits an unpleasant smell, polluting the air. Business operators and residents in the vicinity emphasize that the poor West Dam site poses significant health risk. You can see that dustbin over there. I believe that government, somebody holds the contract to be packing that dustbin every, every Monday or every week. But as you can see, that dustbin there has been there for more than two months. Nobody is packing it. And anytime they will come to pack it, the trucks that will pack that will convert those dirty from uh, that place, you see them, they will splash everything on this road to where they will go and dump the, the, the dustbin, which is very bad. And we want the minister of the, uh, of the FCT to come and see this place by himself. Because the people they gave the job is not they are not functioning. To give a person a job or a contract. And you don't come and check if the person is doing it appropriately. So this place is causing is digging is, is causing a hazard to human health, uh, which is not good. For example, this place can cause cholera to human health. Residents having staged a peaceful protest demanding the allocation of a new dump site away from the residential areas express frustration at the lack of intervention by the FCT management. If government can find another place that is very secured to be packing all these things. And mostly, we here in Karu, the majority of the dust we bring around is from Karo site, federal housing, Jukwe, all they are coming to dub it here. And the place is purposely for burial ground parking space. Message to the minister, we've been seeing all these kind of things. We hope that the work he did in the rivers will reflect here in FCT, but up to now, we have not seen anything on ground. Expert highlights that inadequate waste management can lead to the spread of diseases and contribute to environmental degradation. Our World in Data, a research organization, reports that less than 12% of waste generated in Nigeria is recycled, with approximately 80% ending up in landfills and unregulated dam sites. Ibrahim Ismail, Trust TV News, Abuja. The holiday season is traditionally a time for people to celebrate with loved ones, either at home or at recreation centers. However, there are some who spend the festive period working and trying to earn a living despite the extended Christmas and New Year holidays. Trust TV's Adam Imam visited Gombe and Bauchi Motor Parks for this report, take a look. During our visit to the park, passengers' numbers were not as high as expected. 
Stakeholders including Hassan Saini, a member of the NU RTW, and Ahmed Saleh, a driver, share insights with Trust TV, shed lights on the challenges they face during the holiday season. The increase in the cost of living has really affected almost every aspect of life. During last year's Yuletide, passengers crowded here, but this year there is a significant reduction. This is because of the hike in the price of petroleum products. We drivers usually load from the park and collect money from passengers when we enter filling stations to buy fuel. But this time around, the money is not even enough to get fuel that will take you to your destination and back. Hence, we have to increase the fares. Passengers lamenting, we are also lamenting. That is where we are right now. Additionally, hawkers and food vendors in this category share their experiences amidst the high inflation rate of food items, especially during festive period or at the end of the year. Everything you see is a direct implication of the removal of fuel subsidy. People are suffering. A major of rice is now 1,200. Before now, it was 700 naira and at most 800 naira. We don't know what will happen next because we realize that even the price of crude oil will increase in the market. The market is not encouraging at all. By this time last year, my food would have finished. But that is not the case this year. This is because of the hike in fuel price. Even drivers think twice before buying our food because they are thinking of saving their money. Passengers do patronize us. In fact, my meat usually finish before 3 o'clock. Despite the hardship, people buy suya at the motor park here, where about 7 to 8 people selling suya here, and all of us are patronized. Passengers don't buy sugar cane now like they did before due to the prevailing economic situation in the country. Furthermore, they express concern over the current situation, attributing it to the lingering high cost of living resulting from the removal of fuel subsidy. The common man, they emphasize, is still feeling the economic heat. Adami Imam. Trust TV News, Gombe. And still on the New Year's Eve, drivers and management of the transport companies in Yenagua are decrying low patronage due to low turnout of passengers. They attribute this decline to the soaring cost of transportation, direct consequence of the recent fuel price hike. Trust TV's Friday, Ibimo Boy Peter reports. Drivers at a Yenagua transport firm, James Ogbechi, and Prince Obama Gabriel points to the nation's challenging economic conditions as the primary cause for the low turnout. They reminisce about last year when the entire park was bustling with passengers. The cost of uh, low passenger today, the economic is too, is too hard compared to last year. Compared to last year, if of New Year, you see people are flowing, going, coming, but this year, because of the, f the cost of the subsidy, fuel, and others, the tunnel was too poor. Imagine today we just, just uh, one vehicle and it is not full. Compared to last year, we load like two, three vehicles. Managing the condition now, you know, we know that it's not easy. But everybody, we, we sit up. I'm not the fuel matter. It started like uh, three months ago. Now we, are, we have adapted to the system. Vincent Tukumbo, secretary of a transport firm, and Emmanuel Angese, public relations officer, expressed their surprise at the low turnout considering the early hours they usually start their operations. They call on the federal government to activate the refineries to alleviate the current situation. When we look at it, last year was more better. Even year before last, like today, we didn't. I was thinking that today, I came very early from to to the office, thinking that maybe there will be a rush, believing that most people will travel. 
Well, find out that they like in our uh, routes to Abuja, very few, even the GID that is next behind us, too, they did not get much passenger. Other uh, transport company around us, the price and all the rest, including our own company, too. We just load only one vehicle. Let us make sure that the refineries are working. You know, when the refineries are working and there is competitive in the market in terms of supplying of this fuel product, it will help to reduce the price and we will not feel the impact. And um, for Abuja, we have low flow of passengers. When, when we have good luck as our leader there, we have passengers more than Abuja. Even by this time, we can have flow to Abuja still. But today, the flow of passengers to Abuja from Yenegua is not much. But thank God we are still trying to see how we can make ends meet still. As the clock ticks into the new year, numerous motor parks in Yenegua were an empty look. This situation summarizes the experience most Nigerians in 2023, which has been largely defined by the prevailing economic conditions. From Yenegua, Friday, Ebimoboe Peter, Trust TV News, Yenegua. Thank you, Friday, for that report. Now, the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency and DLEA has intercepted a Qatar-based businessman, Agu Evidence Amobi, and one Uche Igbo Onyebuchi Obi, with consignment of psychoactive substances at the Murtala Mohammed International Airport, MMIA, Kecha, Lagos. The director of media and advocacy and DLEA headquarters, Femi Babathemi, on Sunday disclosed that Amobi was arrested on Saturday at the departure point of Terminal 2 of the Murtala Mohammed International Airport on his way to Doha on a Qatar Airways flight. Obi was taken into custody the same day following the seizure of a consignment of 72,000 pills of tramadol, 225 milligrams, which they attempted shipping to Kano on a local flight. Amobi, who claimed he's been living and working in Doha, Qatar for over 10 years, was caught with 1.30 kilograms of cannabis sativa concealed in a bag of foodstuff. He claimed he bought the substance in Enugu to deliver in Doha to enable him raise enough funds to pay his rent in Doha and Nigeria and the school fees of his three children. Similar arrests were also made in Yobe, Kano, Imo and Kwara states respectively. You're watching the news hour on Trust TV. Still to come. ECOWAS sanctions on Niger Republic leave border communities in economic crisis. Well, these and more news after the break. Don't go anywhere. Should I keep quiet? Mm. And then we kept saying, can't we teach these people basic business, not hustling? Mm. Teach our people entrepreneurship, not hustling. Go to China, Guangzhou, different districts. They can talk fair. <laughs> Am I saying what you don't know? So this about this thing. Yeah, but this, this like time it. around we are talking about appointment of like ministers, sir, where there is I'm an express okay. provision in now, the constitution now, let's go, let's, as regards let's that. Come to appointment. Mm. You know, it is the status of SCT that the constitution has made is too complicated for people to understand. However, if you are to go backwards and do a kind of audit, you will be shocked to find that the resources so far expended on the SDGs far outstrips the achievements face to face. Most of the time when you are involved, uh, it's difficult for you to draw back and have a holistic view. Mm -hmm. Because what? Sentiment would always come to play because all of us would definitely, I had, like I told you yesterday, I was 100% convinced that you cannot say you are qualified without bringing any document. Welcome back to the news hour on Trust TV. If you're just joining, well, here's a recap of the major headlines. Service chiefs visit plateau as attacks on communities continue. And poor waste management in Abuja poses serious health risks for residents. And moving on to more stories now, President Bola Tinubu will address Nigerians on New Year's Day. A statement from the presidential spokesman, Ajuri Ngelali, says the nationwide broadcast will be aired on Monday at 7 a.m. The statement enjoyed 
radio television stations and other electronic media outlets to hook up to the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority at the Federal Radio Cooperation of Nigeria for the broadcast. Also, blazing fire emanating from a diesel tanker on Saturday destroyed two shops and a football viewing center in the Ilori metropolis of Kwara State. It was gathered that the fire incident happened at about 10.47 a.m. at Magaji Are quarters, Ajegunle, in the Idiakbe area of the Ilori East local government. It was learned that the fire originated from a pumping machine being used to transport diesel from a tanker lorry to a container near a mast belonging to one of the telecommunications company. Uh, according to a spokesperson for the state fire service, Hassan Adekunle, the total estimated property saved was around 145.2 million naira, while a total estimated property loss was summed up to be around 34.6 million. He said that firefighters arrived on time to face the tanker fire containing 22,000 liters with registration number MUS916YF. The fire service urged the general public to play safe, especially during the festive period, and not to hesitate to call fire brigade on time whenever there is any such fire emergencies in the areas. Also, a fire outbreak has raised a section of the National Arts Theatre in Igomu, Lagos. A statement on Sunday by the Permanent Secretary, Lagos State Emergency Management Agency, Lasema, Olufemi Damilolaoke, or Saintolu, said the fire was caused by a gas explosion. He said many 50 kg gas cylinders and a bungalow comprising three offices were destroyed in the incident. He added that the operation was conducted jointly by Lasema response team, Lasembos, Lagos State Fire and Rescue Services, the Federal Fire Service, LASMA, Nigeria Police Force, and LNSC officers. And residents of border communities in Katsina State say they are feeling the pains of the present economic crunch in the country due to border closure and fuel subsidy removal. Now, according to them, the continuous closure of the border with Niger Republic frustrates them and the Nigerian economy as a whole. Abdullah Yamadi visited the affected communities in Katsina State and sent in this report. Life here has turned to the survival of the fittest as the struggle to make ends meet is animals and requires one to have the energy and to be fearless in confronting border officials. The residents accused the government of making policy decisions which contributed to the collapse of the socio-economic setting of the border communities. This is Brendan Kuka, a border control post in Marshy local government where security men prevented Trust TV news crew from taking pictures, but residents protested accusing officers of extortion. Since the border closure in August, citizens of the two countries have resorted to transporting goods and services with ox carts through illegal routes after paying huge amount of money to border security operatives. We are in a sorry state at the moment. We don't have anything due to this economic crisis occasioned by border closure. I am from Niger Republic, but before I cross in and out, I have to settle security men. The situation is unbearable. Besides enduring harsh economic realities, the border communities are also battling with perennial water shortage, lack of social amenities and unbearable living costs, with many looking malnourished. Everywhere within the border communities, we are suffering from multiple problems, socially, economically, etc. Sometimes we think whether we are really Nigerians because we are treated badly. From Jibia to Dankama, Kongolam up to Babamutum, we are treated like animals. What is our offense? Is it because we are Nigerians? suffering everywhere. We want the government that sends security men to border communities to ensure effective supervision and monitoring of its officials. I don't want to comment on their conduct, 
but let there be justice and fairness. Residents of Niger Republic often cross into Nigerian villages with little amount of money to buy basic goods and go back to their country. Observers say the continuous land border closure has crushed the northern economy, subjecting many to untold hardship, leaving locals at the mercy of security operatives feeding fats from extortion. Abdullahi Izumay Amadi, Trust Television News, Kazana. Climate change has triggered a rapid decline in natural water sources affecting rural areas where ponds, streams and rivers are crucial for water supply. In this report, Jimmy Azande captures the difficulty a community in Benue faces in order to access drinking water. Take a look. This is what life is like in the hinterlands. Rural dwellers find themselves traversing long distances in search of water for their everyday needs. A struggle vividly illustrated in Tsavnum village where women share the burden and express the hardships they endure on a daily basis. Water is a major problem in this village. I'm married here with six kids now and a grandmother. Whether it is drinking water or for other uses. We go to farm and come back tired going in search of water. What is that the source of water we get is not even good for human consumption. People, we can only beg for help. We are appealing for intervention from government and spiritual individuals to please come to our aid. Beyond the challenges, there's a growing concern about the water's hygiene, rendering it unsuitable for human consumption. The water gives us infections and diseases like typhoid. But without option, we consume what we have, leaving the rest to God. Despite resorting to makeshift water treatment methods out of desperation, it remains far from an ideal solution. When we source for the water, we do some local treatment with alum, allow it to stay for at least five minutes before usage. Yet, this is not good enough for human consumption. A help would be appreciated. Hope is emerging from Governor High St. Elias' commitment to granting autonomy to local government administration. Anticipation builds for potential solutions, reminiscent of past successes when the third tier played a vital role in community development. Jimmy Azande, Trust TV News, Makodi. And as a countdown to the New Year celebration unfolds, Yenagua residents in Bayosa State are expressing their expectations for the upcoming year 2024. While speaking to Trust TV Friday, Bimoboe, Peter, they highlight key concerns around the economy as they call on both the state and federal governments to address pressing issues affecting the livelihoods of Nigerians. The new year is upon us and residents are looking forward to the new year with a lot of expectations as they acknowledge the effort made by the state and federal government so far. However, they emphasize the need for intensified effort in the coming year to address the challenges faced by the masses. I will first and foremost appreciate the government for their up and doing. Uh, well, sometimes your expectation may not be 100% met. But what we have seen so far, we appreciate God for that. And we appreciate the government for the security we are enjoying, especially in Bayesa here. Uh, we sleep with our two eyes loose. And uh, especially we that we are not uh, from Bayesa, we enjoy going about our businesses. We go and come back in peace. And uh, by next day, we expect the government to do more to make sure that they, they maintain the, the, the peace in the states. Like this first substitute that we are facing into is killing the economy. 
For example, places that we are used to go, like with 100 naira, 200 naira, if we find it 500, mm -hmm. and stabilizing our economy, like dollar, is rising every day, it's affecting us. We will be business businessmen. Like when we are going to buy a pipe now, we are used to buy one inch pipe like 1,000, but now it's 1,800. Another resident, Adoro Savior, shares her concerns about the challenges experienced in the current year, such as the new Naira note policy, fuel price hikes, and increases in commodity prices. She voiced a collective sentiment expressing a desire to avoid a recurrence of such issues in 2024 my expectation for 2024 mostly is this uh, fuel subsidy really doing the way we say people will feel by them because this a little of fuel 700 naira the thing they choke people a lot M mostly we be, be, be business people if they choke us well we are 2023 we experience uh, cashless policy and that the thing takes so many people be, be village that cashless people, if you don't know, you don't know. So we still pray, may cashless policy not come back again. Despite the ongoing celebration season, the persistently high fuel prices remain a point of contention for many Nigerians. The new year will mark a new beginning with the hope that it will come with a positive changes. Friday, Ebimobowe Peter, Trust TV News, Yenagoa. And in Delta State, clerics are rallying Nigerians to embrace renewed hope and maintain optimism about the future of the country. This charge emerged during various Thanksgiving services held to mark the end of the year. Despite the challenging economic climate, the clerics assert that Nigerians have much to be thankful for. Trust TV's Jonathan Awayai has more on the story. <laughs> With the year drawing to a close, individuals harbor high expectations, aspiring to achieve significant milestones in the upcoming year. In an interview with Trust TV, Dr. Maswe Egbe, presiding bishop of Honor World Assembly, urges Nigerians not to lose courage despite the nation's challenging conditions. He encouraged people to dream big and believe in their potential for greatness in the upcoming year. So my prayer that the year coming should be much more profiting, promising than we have ever seen on the earth. Now let's not try to bring us to a place where we feel that it's going to get more worse. It's going, nobody gets married and prays for crisis. Nobody gets to school and prays for crisis. Nobody gets into a plane and plan to crash. Nobody drives a car and plan to crash. So I'm going to say the same thing. Nobody should get into 2024 and plan to fail. Let's have a broader mind perspective that we are all going to meet the success we dream of. My prayer for everyone is that the size that God has for everyone, they will obtain it. And uh, evil will be so far from those God has selected to show his mercy on. And I believe that your best days are ahead of them. And let them all stay blessed in Jesus' name. Others appeal to the federal government to implement people-centered programs and initiatives, making life manageable as the new year unfolds. Go forward for 2024. It's just an appeal to the powers that be, talking about the government, to make life a little bit easier. They should allow the masses to breathe. Let me use, you know, according to our president, to allow the masses to breathe, you know, make the economy friendly. They should make, let it be steady. We are not acting for too much. The reason why so many persons, uh, so many young ones are uh, jackpire, you know, because life is easier that way. They should make life, let there be light, the economy, Give us what it will take to become uh, com com comfortable. The coming up of refineries and uh, other federal government economic policies, we should be optimistic that uh, 2034 will be a noble year. There will be great achievement. The economy will not remain this. I think 
in my opinion, there will be improvement in the economy. Spiritual leaders express enthusiasm for seeing the year 2024 as a period of uncommon breakthrough for all Nigerians. They predicted that the focus of the year will bring national growth and development. Jonathan Awai, Trust TV News, Asaba. Away from the south south now to the southwest, the Oyo State Police Command has paraded no fewer than 38 crime suspects allegedly involved in various degrees of criminal activities at various locations across the state. The suspects were paraded at the State Police Command, Eleyeleibado, Oyo State. According to the police, 207 armed robbery suspects were arrested while 50 stolen vehicles 46 motorcycles and tricycles, 108 firearms and 721 rounds of various caliber of ammunition were retrieved from the suspects within the year. The Oyo State Public Relations Officer, SPR Dewali Oshifeso, who spoke to journalists on behalf of the Commissioner of Police, CPR Debola Amzat, said the suspects were picked up at various hideouts following credible intelligence received at the state command. Nonetheless, officers and men of the command have stamped their feet on the ground to assert professionalism, strength and courage in the fight against crime across the length and breadth of all your states. Uh, the Township patrols are more of a confidence building patrol to ensure that uh, commuters, uh, residents alike, that will be you know, going from one point to another this festive period will have enough confidence to do so. Everything is okay. No wala, no anything. You are doing right. You are doing better for us. Oh, yeah. And then you, then, uh, for police, you are manage every, every other thing where you're going to about or us for this area. You manage it very well. Concerns are mounting over foreign interference impacting Nigeria's cocoa industry prompting stakeholders to advocate for government policies aimed at safeguarding and optimizing the potential of the local cocoa economy. Trust TV's Hamid Oyegbadi completes the story. Cocoa, once a pivotal non-oil export commodity driving Nigeria's foreign exchange earnings in the pre-oil era, has witnessed a decline in the country's production and export standing. Cocoa farmers and agripreneurs are expressing their distress over foreign dominance in the Nigeria's cocoa industry. People that are not even registered with the cocoa association, they go to different areas to buy product and different multinationals go into the farm gate and disrupt the prices there. But if you are actually producing and um, using our cocoa here in Nigeria, that means we're able to deport uh the pot is somehow medicinal so instead of taking the pots and then all the co uh, cocoa abroad we are going to be doing everything here then it's going to create more jobs to counter this trend the cocoa research institute of nigeria and the nigeria export and import bank are actively working to shield nigeria's cocoa industry from undue foreign interference our farmer can process their cocoa in the right way devoid of pesticide residue that will be acceptable in the international world. And that's what Crane is doing. With all our technologies, all our innovations, we are actually passing it across to farmers to do it right. So we um, encourage even our exporters not to export raw commodities, but to add value, either convert the cake into cocoa butter or, you know, um, other forms of uh, cocoa products, you know, and then export. That way, they get more money. The Olani of Etioni, Obadokun Thompson, a traditional ruler from a major cocoa producing town in Oshun State, emphasizes the importance of enlightening cocoa farmers about the value of their produce and their inherent dignity. So, with a lot of activities and programs that we've initiated, the first thing where we've been working on is to return self-dignity and self-worth to our cocoa farmers. Stakeholders assert that Nigeria's cocoa industry can reclaim its former glory through the implementation of necessary policies 
aimed at protection and revitalization. Amid Oyegbade, Trust TV News, Oshobo. And away from Nigeria, Congo's President Felix Chisikedi has won his re-election with more than 70% of the vote. The country's election commission announced on Sunday. The preliminary results of the December 20th election were announced in the capital, Kinshasa. Amid demands from the opposition and some civil society groups for the vote to be rerun due to massive logistical problems that put the validity of the outcome into question. Chisikedi was followed by businessman Moise Katumbi, who received 18% of the vote, and Martin Foyulu, who received 5%. Nobel Peace Prize winner Dennis Mukwege, a physician renowned for treating women brutalized by sexual violence in eastern Congo, got less than 1%. The election had more than a 40% turnout, with some 18 million people voting. The results will be sent to the Constitutional Court for confirmation. Election Chief Dennis Kadima said, Opposition candidates opposing the results have two days to submit their claims and the Constitutional Court then has seven days to decide. The final results are expected on January the 10th and the President is scheduled to be sworn in at the end of the same month. Away from Africa, U.S. Navy helicopters sank three small boats used by Iran-backed Houthi militants to attack a Maersk merchant vessel in the Red Sea. The U.S. Central Command, NATCOM, CENTCOM rather, said on Sunday, the Yemen-based Houthis have repeatedly targeted vessels in the vital Red Sea shipping lane with strikes they say are in support of Palestinians in Gaza. The Maersk Hanju container ship reportedly being struck by a missile while transiting the Bab al-Mandab Strait and was attacked by four Houthi ships attempting to board it. Mesk said the ship was undamaged and able to continue its journey but said it would suspend transit through the Red Sea Strait for 48 hours. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Saturday that the Philadelphia Corridor buffer zone that runs along Gaza's border with Egypt must be in Israeli hands. And as the year concludes, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has issued fresh threats of a nuclear attack on Seoul and directs the military to bolster its arsenal, preparing for a potential war that he claims can break out at any time on the peninsula. According to state media, Kim criticized the United States in a lengthy speech during the year-end party meetings, outlining his country's military, political and economic policy decisions for 2024. Plans for the Upcoming year include the launch of three additional spy satellites, the development of unmanned drones, electronic warfare capabilities, and the reinforcement of nuclear and missile forces, as reported by the official Korean Central News Agency. In response to perceived threats, Washington recently deployed a nuclear powered submarine in the South Korean port city of Busan and conducted joint drills with Seoul and Tokyo involving long range bombers. Inter-Korean relations hit a low point this year with Pyongyang's spy satellite launch leading Seoul to partially suspend a 2018 military agreement aimed at diffusing tensions. And in sports, Ugandan athlete Benjamin Kiplagat has been found dead in Kenya, police said on Sunday, with local media reports saying he had been murdered. The Kenyan-born Kiplagat, 34, had represented Uganda internationally in the 3,000 meter steep, steeple chase, including several Olympic Games and World Championship. His body was found in a car on Saturday night on the outskirts of the Rift Valley town of Eldoret, home to many athletes. Authorities say an investigation has been launched and officers are on the ground pursuing leads. Local police commander Stephen Okal told reporters in Eldoret. He said Kiplagat's body had a deep knife wound to his neck, suggesting that he was stabbed. 
And in tennis, Rafael Nadal will face former U.S. Open champion Dominic Thiem in the first round of the Brisbane International in a tough return to the ATP Tour after almost a year off due to injury. Thiem, a former world number three who was beaten by Nadal in the 2018 and 2019 French Open finals, battled through two tough qualifying rounds to make the main draw. Like Nadal, he has also struggled with injury and fell to 352 in the world in 2022 following a right wrist tear. He is currently ranked world number 98. The two men have played 15 times with Nadal winning 9 and theme 6. However, the Australian has won their past two encounters at the ATP Tour Finals in 2020 and the Australian Open in the same year. They are scheduled to play on Tuesday. And that wraps up the news hour on Trust TV. Do well to follow us across all of our social platforms and also catch our live stream on YouTube for more news programs and documentaries. I'm Sagi Ibrahim. Thank you for watching and good night. Daily Trust News Center, this is the News Hour.